welcome to the Bible Dialogues podcast and video. Today's topic, Misreading Romans, Episode 1, Romans 9, 27-29. Today is the first episode of Misreading Romans. The series title reflects how many aspects of Paul's writings are misunderstood by all commentators. I present this title as a bit of a tease, but it reflects reality in the difficulties of understanding what Paul has said. The previous misconceptions do not reflect poorly on the great talent addressing this letter, but rather just shows the challenges due to these difficulties. The understanding of the letter involves the minds of many contributors. Additionally, Paul demonstrates some abstract thinking which often escapes us. I hope to contribute some useful thoughts, albeit rare ideas, in the study on Romans today. We will be looking at the following passages, Romans 9, 1 through 7, 9, 27 through 29, chapter 11, verses 26 to 27, Isaiah 10, verses 20 to 22, chapter 27, verse 9, in chapter 59, verses 20 to 21. Look for the Bible Dialogues at the following locations. YouTube at the Bible Dialogues, Podbean, iTunes, and iHeart. What we have in Romans is, Paul wrote to the Roman Gentile Christians who thought Jews lost their chance to be saved. The beginning of the letter presents various techniques to gain their interest in hearing what Paul has written. After the initial chapters, Paul steps through different obstacles of their thoughts and behaviors in preparation for a message pushing for their change of attitude toward the Jews in Romans 9-11. to Today we will have some insights on Romans 9, 27 to 29. The focus will be on the remnant and the promise. Paul provides this text about the remnant works as proof of God's faithfulness to Israel. Paul shows all Israel as a remnant in Romans 11. The remnant refers to prophecy fulfillment in the first century. This remnant does not have a general meaning as if any small group of godly people left over in a city or country constitutes a remnant. This remnant consists of the Jewish people as the way God remains faithful to his promises. Our main scripture then is Romans 9, 27 to 29. This is out of the web translation, which is at ebible.org. Verse 27, Isaiah cries concerning Israel, If the number of the children of Israel are as the sand of the sea, it is a remnant who will be saved. For he will finish a work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. As Isaiah has said before, unless the Lord of armies had left us the seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been made like Gomorrah. The overview we have of Romans then is Romans 9-11 to presents Paul's own emotional investigation into the lack of response of his people to the gospel. God's faithfulness to his promises to Israel is mentioned for support of Jews still coming to Christ at that time, is scoped in faithfulness and obligation to the forefathers, is to share to, and is shared to remind Gentiles of God's faithfulness to all who are in Christ. The remnant then has a specific meaning. Some people, as mentioned before, expect the remnant exists in each generation. This idea does not make sense because there is no definition of the broad group anymore. We're all people, we're all Gentiles. These verses continue to redefine Israel as only consisting of the remnant. Romans 9, 6-9 starts with a reduction in the past, which then helps to see the reduction at Paul's time. Again, Paul speaks of a remnant in his time in Romans 11, verses 1-7. through They were the elect. The elect and remnant mean the same thing. They are interchangeable. The elect tells us how Paul understands all Israel of Romans 11, verses 26 to 27. 
This meant that those of Judea who had not come to Christ were not part of Israel at the destruction of Jerusalem. The remnant were those of Jerusalem who survived the wrath, which is shown in verse in verse 22 of Romans 9. The mention of the remnant continues the theme of the narrowing of Israel based on the promise as found in Romans 9, 6 through 12. So in verses 27 and 28, they're quoting Isaiah 10, 20 to 22. The context of both concerns the wrath of God against Jerusalem. The church in Rome through, thought all of the Jews had lost their chance to be saved. So Paul rejects their view by pointing out that a remnant would be saved. In Romans 11, 1, Paul even says he too is an Israelite. The folks in Rome are reading this letter from him. It would be odd for them then to read this much of the letter if they don't think Paul is one of those being saved. We see then that the remnant is very specific to Israel. At the same time, Paul shows that the prophecy of Isaiah 10, 20 to 23 is being fulfilled. The end and the cutting short refer to the judgment of Jerusalem. Many people have missed the significance of this judgment in Scripture and especially in Isaiah. The phrase, a remnant will return and similarly saved, refers not to survivors in Jerusalem, but rather to those of the Israel people who returned to God at that time. As we can recall from the Gospels, Jesus gave the warning to flee Jerusalem. This full end not only is about Jerusalem, but also about the sequence of four empires in Daniel. These empires were rods of discipline of Jacob and Israel, so their need disappeared with the end of Jerusalem. In verse 29, the Isaiah 1 verse 9 verse sounds similar to the judgments Jesus spoke of his era, which would leave places in a similar situation as Sodom and Gomorrah. That dire situation was all that the Roman Gentiles expected anymore. But Paul reminds them that there was a, to be a remnant. So concerning the remnant and elect, in, in Romans 9 to 11, Paul is proving God's faithful to, faithfulness to Israel. It is this remnant by which that promise is fulfilled. In 11, verse 26, Paul knows all Israel being saved. The point expresses the completeness of the promise to Israel. Paul shows that the promises were true. This mention of all Israel only makes sense in view of early redefining of Israel to the remnant. Otherwise, the discussion on that remnant was not important. In 11, verse 28, this election is for the sake of the fathers of the promise. These would be people like Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. This faithfulness makes best sense in light of the significant end of the covenant <clears throat> rather than saving a limited number of the people now only to wait for a future of more people of Israel to get saved. To project this point of all Israel into the future, would be as trivial as saying Gentiles are saved in the future. Paul says that there no longer remains a difference of Jew and Gentile. Thus, the future saving of Israel serves no justice to the fathers of Rome, Romans 11, verse 28. When we see Paul's heartfelt concern for his people in Romans 9, uh, 1 through 6 and 10, verse 1, the problem of compassion for people 2,000 years down the line is not likely. Instead, Paul's compassion occurs in light of the destruction of Jerusalem and the limited time for the people of Israel to respond to the evangelism of his era. Overall, then, no remnant and no elect exist, except Paul refers to a narrow argument of all Israel being saved in that first century. There is no Israel after that. So specifically <clears throat> in Romans 11, verses 25 to 27, it reads as, For I don't desire for you to be ignorant, brothers, of this mystery, so that you won't be wise in your own conceit, <clears throat> that, a, 
that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, even as it is written. There will come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The first point to note concerns Paul's emphasis on humbling the Gentiles to removing their boasting against Jews. It seems useless to just speak of a far future saving of Israel to reduce that boast. The next important detail is that the hardening of Israel and the mention of the fullness of Gentiles does not best define our understanding of all Israel. The terms are a bit vague, but we may see the partial hardening may likely refer to the majority of bloodline Israel while allowing that the unhardened have previously been described as a remnant. The fullness of Gentiles does not get defined anywhere either and may simply be the status that the Roman church assumed of themselves. Paul's goal in Romans 11 is to achieve a friendly attitude of the Gentiles toward the Jews. If the fullness of Gentiles is yet a future achievement, the Roman Gentiles don't really need to do anything at this time. The biggest issue against the future event becomes evident by the lack of a prophecy of all Israel being saved beyond the first century. Paul does not appear to be a prophet. He only interprets prophecy within his letters. So the critical quote of, of um, Romans 11, 26-27 refers to the deliverer out of Zion who takes away the ungodliness of Jacob. This refers to Isaiah 59, 20-21, and the quote from Romans eleven twenty six appears in the previous slide. This prophecy describes the grace through Christ in the first century. The dominant prophetic reason for Jesus to appear was to cleanse Israel of its unrighteousness. Yet we forget that the prophecies of the Messiah have, be, have been to expose and resolve the troubles of Israel, and to provide the ultimate deliverance from their misbehavior. This solution is through Christ's death and resurrection. Earlier in Isaiah 59:16c to 18, as we see here, the Lord is shown to act by his own arm to bring forth justice. Christ Jesus is the arm of the Lord. The adversaries or enemies were to some extent the Roman officials, but they were also the rich of Judea when oppressing their own people. So Christ came into view in this part of the passage before the section quoted by Paul. 27.9 in Isaiah also is quoted by Paul in Romans 11.27. Therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be forgiven. And this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. We don't quite have to know the fruit or action resulting from the removal of his sin. This basically refers to the end of idolatry. Paul int Paul's interest primarily concerns the forgiveness of Jacob. Paul quotes this in connection with the forgiveness in Christ. This again happened in the first century. Verse 12 of Isaiah 27 speaks of the process of, as a gleaning. The gleaning is gather the good stuff. There are clearer translations than this, but the idea is somewhere along that line. The verse also reinforces the concept of a remnant being saved. Prophecy interpretation often is difficult, but part of the effort includes keeping the prophecies in context. A certain amount of those prophecies are poetic and symbolic, but most of significance, though, the prophecies used by Paul support a first century event in surrounding verses, and that is how they should be interpreted. So we have transitions happening at this time. We miss the significance of events in the first century. Christ Jesus is the sole focus now. The obligations to Israel were completed, or nearly so, as Paul wrote. There remains no further event for redemption, especially not from anything to be expected based on Romans 11. Similarly, it does not appear that any Old Testament prophecies extend to a future situation concerning Israel. This point may appear most controversial, but as more and more prophecies appear to have obvious fulfillment, 
in the Old Testament, it becomes difficult to find any remaining prophecies for a future era. One key aspect is recognizing that Paul has been mentioning that no distinction remains between Jew and Gentile. Uh, that is not to quite be restrictive as to say that no Jew exists, but the distinction was previously based on two groups, Jews and not Jews. Instead of looking at things that way, we can see people as simply people and at times maybe focus on one ethnicity or another, but on equal terms. Paul's consistency then depends on there being no future hope distinctly for Israel. The current hopes and benefits now go to people across all nations. None of this is to imply that distinct promises to Israel's benefit have failed, nor should these promises be assumed to be taken over by the church. As implicit in the study, the prophecies often are hard to decipher, which means that many readings have been made on incorrect assumptions. I hope to share some ways that these misunderstandings have taken root. The expansion of the rule of Christ and his kingdom is now the goal. There are also eventual resurrection that has yet to be hoped uh, and realized. So some final points. The general direction and message of Romans 9 to 11 has been presented, but this study only reflects the starting point and ending point of the way Paul approached this message. A key factor in this letter, then, is the transition to a new era. One element downplayed in many commentaries is the general propriety of checking the context of passages quoted in the New Testament. The significance of the remnant through the deep research ends up filling in some critical details of Romans 9, 27 to 29. Paul's goal was to change the attitude of the Roman Gentiles from a rejection of Jews into a benevolent attitude toward them. The actual disputes, however, go both directions, but that point is saved for another study. This should be a generally accurate analysis of the situation in Romans 9 to 11. It is certainly expected that some new avenues of exploration are available, plus some insights into Isaiah's prophecies also should be possible now. And with that, we conclude episode one, Misreading of Romans. Thanks for visiting.